This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash uctv prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. to uh, thank the organizers for this kind invitation. It's always a pleasure to come back to this side of the country. I've been tasked this morning to speak a f for a few minutes about this uh, kind of potpourri of adjunctive techniques to overcome current limitations of device availability to treat complex aortic aneurysms. Uh, so these are my disclosures. I have some relationships with Cook and Bolton. This presentation also will, uh, will discuss, obviously, for reasons off-label use of uh, FDA-approved medical devices. So what are these techniques? So you have chimney snorkels. Many people use them interchangeably. I don't know the history in terms of which came first. And then fenestrations and so-called sandwich techniques, which is the latest entrant into this uh, potpourri uh, of techniques. The indications are uh, pretty well accepted, uh, although not strictly codified per se. Anatomy is unsuitable for conventional infrarenal or thoracic devices. Uh, these are the list of possible anatomic indications include absent necks, angulations, conical or large, beyond what is currently offered uh, under standard devices. And when we talk about suitability or unsuitability, we're once really talking about endovascular suitability, not so much surgical. Clearly, many people would define this as an infrarenal uh, aneurysm, and, and for an open uh, surgery, this would be a fairly straightforward repair. But for an endovascular uh, therapy, this can pose certain unique challenges. So let's talk about chimney. Uh, one working definition, and this is one acronym that you've seen in literature occasionally, the so-called CHIVAR, or chimney EVAR, is an adjunctive or parallel branch vessel, such as illustrated here, that runs alongside of the endograft it, during intentional endograft coverage, although historically, when one reads the literature back, coming out back in the early 2000s, the original uh, uh, um, uh, way this was initially used for salvage techniques when the endograft misdeployed slightly over the target vessels and actually occluded them. And in, a sal in order to salvage the renal artery, this type of parallel technique was used. And as you can see, this type of technique, uh, while originally envisioned for the abdominal or the perivisceral segment, can be applied for the distal landing zone in this thoracic repair with a reverse or so reverse chimney or so-called periscope technique. In this particular case, salvage of the celiac artery with extension of the cover section right to the origin of the SMA. What about fenestrations? Obviously, scallops is another term that should be associated with this type of endograft construct. Again, another acronym that's come about with, in association with this type of device is the so-called FIVAR, or fenestrated endovascular aneurysm repair. This is a nice company uh, depiction of such a device. You could see the fenestration here and a scallop, which is an incomplete fenestration, typically uh, used for openings for the celiac or the SMA. Uh, the fenestrations are circular and uh, scallops are semicircular. It can be variable sizes and positions, and it must be custom designed to patient anatomy, or though more lately, some of you may have heard, uh, Cook has uh, uh, made some ingenious uh, design modifications to the actual fenestration such that potentially an off-the-shelf or a standardized fenestrated, not branch, but fenestrated construction uh, may be possible in the future. And while some people have uh, use the term branched in, when fenestrated constructs are used in conjunction with the so-called covered uh, uh, adjunctive stenting versus bare metal. Uh, again, as Tim alluded to in his talk, uh, there is a clearly distinct mechanical and functional differences of whether you put a covered stent in the fenestration and call it kind of pseudo-branch versus using a true branched endograft. 
So what about the sandwich? This is the latest iteration uh, of this so-called chimney or snorkeling concept. It's an extension of that concept for multiple vessels, usually involving greater than two vessels. I think two vessels can be rendered fairly easily using standard chimney techniques, but when you start going into three or four vessels, you have to be a little bit more creative. Uh, <coughs> as illustrated here, this is a thoracal abdominal aneurysm with four vessel, so-called chimney or snorkeling, snorkeling technique using the standard chain. And you could see this uh, uh, cross-section of a CT image outlined by these colored uh, stripes where you could see where the lie of the, uh, of the various uh, chimney uh, um, uh, stents are in relation to the multiple layers of endografts and <coughs> endografts are performed. I think uh, when one wants to get a true assessment of how these techniques perform relative to each other or to the standard therapy or open therapy, if you will, it's more illustrative to talk about its limitations than its positive attributes, and people are always more interested in the failings rather than the successes. So let's talk about some of the limitations of chivar or chimney or snorkel endovascular repair. The first and foremost that has, achieved, uh, that has received more attention than anything else is this issue of fixation and seal. And it is obvious to most people who know this technique is that uh, fundamentally there's a loss of the continuous wall apposition that uh, fundamentally un underlies uh, the concept of endograft repair. And it's illustrated in this diagram here where you could see a two chimney repair. These are the chimney stents impinging upon the endograft seal along the native aortic wall and for formation of these so-called gutters, which can at least theoretically lead to a type 1A endoleak. This is illustrated in this real case example of a type 1 uh, proximal endoleak after a chimney stenting. And because to reduce this risk, what operators have done and in, have, have done is encroach more and more upon the normal aorta to increase that distance to avoid or reduce the risk of a gutter endoleak and obviously uh, necessitating a longer aortic coverage and the implications, as Dr. Riley said, of potentially increased risk of spinal cord ischemia when otherwise it would not be a risk. Another risk is there is an, a lack of an ideal chimney stent or mating technology, if you will. All the chimney stents are currently av commercially available, and there is not one dedicated for this particular therapy. Uh, <coughs> suffers from kinking, compression, and resulting occlusion, et cetera. There clearly there is a need for flexibility and more increased radial force. And those that have increased radial force can result even native vessel kinking, as illustrated here in this particular example. And all of these, by, <coughs> by the nature of the covering that is required compared to a bare metal stent are relatively of larger profile uh, than one would, be uh, one would desire. Another limitation is the unpredictable lie of chimney stents. And once again, as one enters into multiple chimney stents versus single chimney stents, the actual path of how these stents lie relative to the repair itself is entirely, or well, I should say, almost entirely uncontrollable, although some operator operators may argue with me on that. Obviously, if the lie is not optimal, as illustrated in this particular example, where one chimney stent is actually overlying each other, the, there is increased size of the gutters and with the resulting increased risk of endoleaks. Simultaneous multivessel access is obviously uh, intuitive and it's obvious in these types of repairs requiring upper extremity access, not just uh, one side, but potentially on both sides, sometimes requiring axillary conduits depending on how many vessels you're attacking and difficult arch, just a type three arch to, uh, to borrow a terminology from carotid stenting uh, uh, can, be a, uh, can be a challenge. Simultaneous multivessel deployments are also necessary. Native branch vessel occlusive disease in terms of getting in there from a very remote access becomes an issue also. Also, uh, whenever you want to approach these branch vessels, whether it be for branch endografts or chimney, a lot of those techniques are translatable one to each other. So the so-called upgoing renal artery configuration can prove a technical challenge and may be a relative con technical contraindication for those starting out on this therapy, although there are ways to overcome this. There are very very limited bailout options and obviously cost. The so-called mating chimney stents are not cheap and once you start adding up the cost, they can be uh, quite formidable. The other, and moving on to fenestrated endovascular uh, repairs, 
the, one of the biggest limitations in this uh, therapy is the, uh, is the need for custom manufacturing. You've heard other speakers talk about this. They're not readily available, both from a regulatory standpoint and the need to custom manufacture this. Current time frame is about six to eight weeks. It obviously excludes emergent or urgent therapy. The unfavorable juxtarenal or suprarenal aortic angles can pose a problem as illustrated here, although this isn't that severe, but I'm sure everybody has encountered uh, uh, situations where the juxtarenal angles can be quite severe and the lie and the registration of the particular fenestrations can be a challenge. Native vessel occlusive disease, once again, as previously mentioned, can pose a technical challenge. There's an issue of mating stent technology in terms of kinking and fracture, et cetera. Simultaneous multivessel access, another limitation similar to uh, chimney stenting. In, uh, and the mirror image of the so-called renal artery anatomy problem that was posed for the, finish, for the, uh, for the chimney stents is the so-called downgoing renal artery configuration. But again, for most experienced oper operators, this can also be encountered. And uh, again, uh, this particular therapy has limited bailout options once you, if you were to lose a wire or et cetera. Again, cost is an issue, as you heard Tim say. Uh, Tim mentioned uh, very recently, FDA has approved the Cook fenestrated device. I don't know exactly what the market cost of that endograft itself will be, but if you add to that the other mating technologies, especially covered stents, it can be quite formidable. I don't know what the reimbursement is going to be. And what about sandwiches? Well, you can say it's all the limitations of chimney snorkel technique plus greater risk of gutter-related endoleak because there's more of them, much greater length of normal aortic coverage. You have to cover a lot more to reduce this gutter endoleak. Uh, and uh, long, you'll require long chimney stents, typically over 10 centimeters long, with possibly multiple overlapping stents with all the mechanical concerns regarding that and resulting in significantly increased costs. Some of these mating um, covered stents uh, vary prices according to the length of the stent. So where, where's the beef with all of these different therapies? Piece. Well, uh, the, uh, there obviously is some uh, attention paid to this therapy in, in a very recent publication out in JVS just a few months ago. Uh, they looked at the, they did a systematic review. They had strict inclusion criteria for publications. So 15 peer review publications, 93 patients. 25 of them were performed for emergent indications, 100% technical success rate. Mortality rate is almost triple of what a standard conventional EVAR is. But look at this. This is probably the most telling bullet point, 14% percent type 1a endoleak new renal impairment 12 percent the concluding statement was role of chimney technique and management of complex aneurysms is still unclear reasonable hesitation to embrace the technique and other systematic review in annals of vascular surgery so these are not throwaway journals these are real publications 75 patients looking at the technique from both abdominal and thoracic 96 branches technical success quite uh, acceptable 30-day mortality once again four percent quite consistent. And in this particular paper, the authors uh, kind of limit their enthusiasm, appears as an acceptable alternative for under emergency conditions, not so much elective. What about fenestrated? Uh, uh, the publications are also a little bit limited. 100 patients from Verhoeven's group, 30-day mortality, 1%, significantly less. Branch vessel patency, but once again, something to highlight, new renal impairment up to 25% of patients. And this is Roy's data of the U.S. multicenter experience that was the basis of the current FDA approval, 30 patients, technical success 100 100%. Uh, the last bullet point I'm going to ad address is the 20% adverse renal events. Sandwich, this is not an error. There's really not much written about it except anecdotal presentations in the literature. So how does this all stack up out of three potential pluses, negative being minus? If you look at all of this, technical success, fenestrated probably a little bit better, endoleak a little bit better for fenestrated, neck coverage probably a little bit less for fenestrated, multi-branch uh, uh, situations a little bit better for fenestrated, access again a little bit better, availability obviously chimney it's readily available cost it's going to be a wash either way renal world experience I think there's a little bit more for fenestrated long-term data still relatively lacking for uh, for all of these therapies but a little bit better for fenestrated renal issues continue to plague all of the therapies so in conclusion uh, fenestrated lower risk of type 1 endo leaks less aortic coverage better for multiple vessels Ch uh, chimney is an off-the-shelf widely available 
albeit somewhat poor solution when fenestrated is unavailable. Both methods look, lack long-term data. Open surgery is still a good option for a rare so-called good risk patient. However, you want to define that. I'm not going to talk about that. And clearly, we need a, new, a better mating technology. Thank you very much. Thank you.